Director Mike Donahue's award-winning Oscar-qualifying debut short film, Troy, premiered at the 2022 Tribeca Film Festival and has gone on to screen at another 66 festivals internationally, including the 2023 Sundance Film Festival. Now, it has won over a dozen awards, including the Jury Award for Best Comedy at Aspen Short Fest 2023, the Audience Award for Best Narrative Short at Outfest 2022, and the Vimeo Unofficial Award for Best U.S. Narrative Short at Sundance. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome writer, director, Mike Donahue and his Oscar-qualifying short film, Troy, to the show. Welcome, Mike. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be talking to you today. Man, it's an honor and a pleasure for me, but where in the world did you get the idea of Troy? Where did that come from? <laughs> uh, well, so as a director, I've always been interested in stories that are about surprising kinds of intimacy between people you don't expect to have relationships together. And I'm always interested in stories that are about revealing characters to be something other than who you initially assumed them to be. Uh, but with this one, we had a, a kernel of an experience in real life that was similar to this. We uh, had an apartment with a neighbor who did have really loud, raucous, sort of around-the-clock sex. And, you know, we have cell phone videos that we took of just a sad New York plaster wall. But, like, in the video, you're hearing really, really verbal, filthy, wildly creative uh, sex play. <laughs> uh, so that that part of it is is. I guess, based on a true story. You know, I can kind of relate. Uh, boy, way, way back in the day, being single and having your own apartment. And, <laughs> and you know, back in the day, you know, apartment buildings, uh, you know, they all had thin walls. And thin walls, could, yeah. They still uh, yeah. do in New York. <laughs> well, they can't build any... something at any moment on this interview. Well, no, they can't. They can't build anything new. <clears throat> can't build anything new in New York. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, I had that experience where, you know, when people are playing their music or their TV too loud uh, or or your next door neighbors are they're they're elderly, but their TV is always at full blast because they can't hear anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think my worst experience is one night I I heard this uh, very loud boom and I'm like, yeah. what was that? And and come to find out two days later, the the guy downstairs uh, actually catty corner to our, cause my unit was apartment was uh, on the second floor. His was on the first floor, kind of diagonal down, but we heard this okay. boom and well, let's just say he, uh, finished himself off in the, uh, in the bathroom with a shotgun. So we'll just leave it at that. Oh, yikes. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so there's your next that, short uh, film. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. Everyone shares, feels compelled to share their neighbor noise story with me, with me when I, I talk to them. I, I have yet to hear that story from anybody. That's the first with, you know, sort of like horrible, awful consequences. So I'm sorry to hear that for you and your neighbor. <laughs> well, I was, well, you know, the only thing you can say is that you're happy that it wasn't the one below you because yeah. you're wondering... Gee, what happened if they would have missed? I mean, so, right, but right. that's another story for another day. Who knows? That could be Troy 2.0. Who knows? Yes. Gosh. Maybe not so open-hearted and joyous, that, the sequel. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, what I loved about this film is that it wasn't just about a neighbor who has loud sex, but it also takes a look at the element of assumptions that we all have about other people. I mean, the couple in the film, they start out frustrated by the loud sex noises of their neighbor, but they, but you, you move them through an emotional maze of sorts. Um, was, you know, what was your end game for the couple? Yeah, I think for me, you know, that couple, Tay and Charlie, they're not in a bad relationship, but I think when the film starts, they're in an overly settled, overly comfortable relationship. And so I think they live in, you know, like a very narrow bandwidth of experiences. And I think one of the gifts that Troy gives them is he sort of wakes them up to the peaks and valleys of life. And whether that's really raucous, noisy sex that irritates you or starts to turn you on, or that's like incredible despair and heartbreak or rage or celebratory joy, he sort of reinstills in them a sense of passion and I think also a sense of curiosity. Yeah, because what I loved was that your film 
was not predictable at all. Oh, and, good. Uh, and, 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 I, and that's a great compliment to your writing and filming because I was waiting like, okay, they're hearing all of this sex. Because like when I, when I got the press release and I'm reading the byline, I'm like, okay. So for me, before even seeing the film, you have an assumption. And mm -hmm. then watching it, I'm like, wow, this is not what I was expecting. Because I was expecting the couple to you know, to be frustrated hearing their next door, nor, next door neighbor having all of this loud sex and then maybe, you know, moving into maybe where they're both getting turned on with each other again. Like you said, because they're a very settled couple, but right. you instill this surprise within the film that I loved. And one of the things that I was impressed with this film was the character development of Troy. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it felt critical for us to try to give a, a full sort of like fleshed out, rich, nuanced portrayal of this person. But the challenge we set up for ourselves was to be able to do that without really ever hearing directly from that person or seeing them that we never wanted to give the audience any more access to him than Taya and Charlie did. Um, and so the game became how much could we create a portrait of a human being in these little tiny IV drips of information. Because I think for them, one of the things that is so thrilling about this is that they just get one new little detail and then they're like off and running with it. And hopefully that's part of what's really exciting for us in the audience too, is each new little piece of information, you know, opens up a whole new possible chapter of who this guy is and takes us and our thinking about him and also the film in a, a slightly new direction. Oh, uh, completely. You know, as you're explaining it, I'm thinking about, you know, those, you know, those old wooden puzzles that children would, would yeah. put together. It's like you get one piece, but you're not given the other ones. So you get that one piece and you're like, oh, great. I got that one piece. And then that next little piece comes in. And that's exactly how you created this film, because even for me as an audience, I felt just like the couple, Thea and Charlie. Oh, good. Because you're getting, you're, like you said, you're giving them bits and pieces of Troy without going full bore. I mean, when, when he stepped into the elevator, I was shocked. I'm like, I didn't expect this guy to be some, you know, built jock looking type <laughs> guy. I was like, okay, that was a surprise. And, uh, and I think even Thea was surprised at first, but I love the fact that you never had the couple and Troy ever verbally say anything to each other. I love that. Oh, good. Yeah, that, I mean, that was a very purposeful thing for us. Because I, I think there's something about living in a place like New York or a city like Houston where there is such a, a proximity with your neighbors, but there's also a kind of, um, you know, anonymity that comes from that. I think we all sometimes see people we don't actually know more than we actually see the people we're close to. And I know I at least start to write stories about the people I see in my building or at the bodega every morning. And, you know, we're just going on a few little IV drips, but I have whole, you know, like imaginative universes for who these people are. And, um, I, you know, they, they can start to really take on an impact, um, in your world, even though you've never actually had a conversation with them. I think that's, I think that's one of the things that's really beautiful about living in a big city. It is. And you know, for you, how many iterations of the character did you go through before settling on this one for, by developing Troy? Uh, this, this was sort of the guy for us the whole time. So I, I worked on this with, um, two collaborators, Jen Silverman, who is a, a writer that I work with a lot in the theater and, Dane Laffrey, who is a production designer that we work with, and the three of us sort of storyboarded this together. And then Jen sat down and actually wrote a draft of it. And we wrote it very specifically for a collection of downtown New York theater actors that we've all worked with in the theater and really love. So um, each of these roles was written like very specifically for the actors who all ended up doing this. So we, we did, I think, have a pretty clear sense of who he was going to be starting out and who each of them were going to be and what the, what the arc was going to be for them. Well, you know, I look at Troy as, you know, raging sex drive, jock type, <laughs> more of a male prostitute than a massage therapist. Um, why did you choose the name Troy? <laughs> 
Uh, I know anyway. the scene. <laughs> Yeah, it. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, there, there's that line. I guess it just feels viscerally, like energetically, so evocative and right for who that guy is. That is this kind of like larger than life, sexually charismatic, energetic presence. But um, it is also, you know, like he is also a sex worker. It is part of his job. Um, but there is something so sort of like larger than life about that name itself that. It felt it felt right for at least his sort of, um, you know, like work persona. Well, you know, what was funny is, is when the the mail got misplaced and, and Thea gets hit one of his pieces of mail in her mailbox and she looks down and she sees the name Gino Palazzi. And I'm like, what's wrong with Gino? That could be a very charismatic, <laughs> sexual kind of guy. Um, so I was just like. Wow. So this guy, but in a, but because of the storyline, he had to create a new persona based on his work. So I got that. Right. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the idea is that because, because there is such a stigma in this country about sex work and, you know, we have our own, you know, sort of universally puritanical uh, assumptions and judgments about sex positivity and promiscuity and all of this, I think there is a need for him to create, a, you know, a sort of a persona and identity that is the guy online that does erotic massage versus the guy who sits at home and breaks up with his boyfriend and writes ballads about this and like cries into his boyfriend's voicemail at two in the morning. Well, yeah, you know, like Troy lo uh, loses his boyfriend who doesn't understand Troy's mindset while while right. he's thinking that it's okay to have sex with others while being in a relationship because Troy himself says, it's just work. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and I find, you know, I found, you know, as I, and I, I literally went back multiple times and I, and I played that scene of just that scene where you hear him and his boyfriend yelling at each other. And I'm, and I'm, I played it. I'm like, no, let me play it again. And, uh, because people, some people, if they're not paying attention, may not fully grasp what that relationship is about. Because I find I find that justification of his actions was a great point in this film. It's very subtle, but it's a poignant moment. Um, am I thinking too deep here? No, no. I, I mean, a, I love that you are so thoughtful about this, and you paid such you know sort of specific close attention to us. I think. It was really important for us in telling a story that is about a guy who's a sex worker that we tell the story in a really sex positive way and that he himself, even as he's struggling financially and he's dealing with the fallout in his personal life because of this job, that he does never question the validity of this work and that there isn't, he's not carrying a sense of shame about it or judgment about it um, and that it is legitimate for him and that for this couple, um, you know, who is this sort of like seemingly straight vanilla couple that they never actually uh, have a sense of shame or judgment about his line of work. You know, once they break through the irritation of like the, the noise infiltration, um, none of it for them is ever about the fact that this guy is gay or that he has a lot of sex or that he's a sex worker. It's all the other stuff that, you know, becomes. you bring up a very vital point. The couple, not one time, ever judged Troy yeah. for they didn't judge him on lifestyle. They didn't judge him on work. They, you know, cause it all starts out just because of the noise and they're really rolling their lives. Like, man, is this ever going to end? But the way that you navigate through the story, the way that you bring not only the couple through the story, you're bringing the audience on the exact same ride as the couple. And even I found myself, as I was watching it, n not even a sense of judgment on Troy. And okay. for you to, for the writing and the filming, because, you know, I always tell people, you know, acting is only 50% of a film. Camera work is the other 50%. And the way that you put this together, no one seeing this film, there will never be a sense of judgment, which to me, that's just a brilliant piece of work oh gosh uh wow i really appreciate that i mean it was it was sort of central for us to approach this story with a kind of open-heartedness and joyousness 
both because I think that's what allows Tay and Charlie to be able to connect to this guy is that they are as sort of shut down as they are. They are very open, curious people. But I also, I, it's sort of my hope for the film that it can do that for the audience. Like we were, we were doing a screening in my hometown. You know, I grew up in a very conservative Midwestern town. And um, after the screening, which I like got to take my mother to, there was a Q&A and one person said, um, you know, sort of like my grandparents' generation, uh, said they loved the film and felt it was really important right now because it helped them to realize that this gay guy living on the other side of the wall, that like gay guys, gay people are people too. Um, and that isn't like, I think exactly how I would phrase what, I, what I'm hoping the film does for people, but I, I actually really appreciated that because I think they were zeroing in on the idea that hopefully this story inspires all of us to be a little more curious and a little more empathetic to the people around us in the world that we might not really know and who might at first glance feel very different from us but that you know at the end of the day we all have humanity and we all feel pain and we're all vulnerable and you know i know it's a 16 minute comedy so i'm i'm like this is all you know sort of like wow. with a great of salt, but this i is do a, hope this... that it inspires a little bit of you know, empathy it's, for people. <laughs> well, it's a dark comedy. And, you know, dark comedy is not really where you're you're openly laughing. But right. you're... Man, Mike, you were, you were perfect in the sense that the way... Uh, you know, and let's look, you know, like the older generation today. They still can't grasp the lifestyle. And... <clears throat> But the film, you you feel there's no judgment. Even the there's no way the audience is going to have a feeling of judging the next door neighbor unless they are just so wound tight. Um, but but we live in such a judgmental society more than yeah. ever before. You know, everybody says, "Hey, we need to you know love and accept one another," but in the same time the same groups of people are separating themselves from everybody else, which right. I find that this film is so interesting because one of the points that I kept, you know, when I went back to keep watching the film, what I found interesting is that we are now living in a society where many people are leaving their careers and making more money, let's say on only fans or in the sex industry, even actresses today are doing it now. I mean, was that one of the ideas that played a role in writing the script for Troy's career change? Yeah, I mean, I think that that is definitely, you know, I, I have worked in the theater for the last decade. And I think when the pandemic hit, there were a number of people in the theater who all turned to platforms like OnlyFans because, you know, there was no theater in the pandemic. We all had to find ways to support ourselves from home. So I, I definitely know people and have friends who um, turn to that. And I think, you know, there is so much judgment in the world right now from every side at every other side. I'm not even just saying it goes one way, but I think, I don't know, I, I guess maybe naively, I hope that watching this for 16 minutes maybe softens everyone just a little bit. Well, you know, being a dark comedy, there, you know, to ride, to, to live along, I should say, live along with the couple. Dealing with the loud noises, the, the loud sex that never seems to end. I mean, my first thought was, is, does this guy ever, I mean, how fast is his recovery time? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Seemingly pretty fast, at least in one scene. Yeah, that's so I was just like, wow. I mean, you know how many guys want that kind of stamina? I mean, <laughs> you know, they're probably going to watch the film and over and over again thinking, what's Troy's secret? You know, but, uh, so I found, I found that part kind of funny, but I loved the emotional turn. You know, there's the, there's the, the big disagreement between Troy and, and his boyfriend. And then there's where the noise seems to stop. And I don't want to give the whole film away, but there was the surprise when she walks up to his apartment and, and I was just like, wow, I didn't see that coming. Oh, good. You know, so that. this, you know, so yes. your film, I don't care. The audience is never going to figure out, you know, once they start watching, whatever assumptions they have, every assumption they have at the beginning will be wrong. Great. And that's a good thing. <laughs> that's good. That's my hope. I mean, you know, I, I hope 
I, I think there will be people who dismiss it because it opens with kind of like a long running, like one joke gag of really loud sex while people are doing super mundane activities. But hopefully part of the joy is that it does actually open up into something a little more emotionally grounded and, and like rich than you maybe anticipate it will based on how it opens and sort of tonally, tonally what you think it's going to be. Yeah, and see, and I like surprises. I, you know, I had recently. I'm not going to mention any names. I'm not even going to mention the name of the film. But recently, uh, I did an interview uh, about a current film, and mm -hmm. when I got sent uh, the whole PR release, the synopsis, the moment I read the byline, I'm like, okay. But then when I saw the film, I'm like, it was like the byline. There was no surprise. Right. You basically just told me. You know, by knowing what the film is about and then you stick with that, I would rather be surprised. I would rather be uh, riveted or uh, provoked to thought, to, to ponder. Is there a message in this? Your film, even though it's a dark comedy, there is a message there where it still goes back. Uh, you sh There was no judgment. And I think that's... The, the, the I think it's the very strong point in the message within this film that there is no judgment, but there is this interesting feeling of, like you said, empathy, uh, mm -hmm. caring for a neighbor that you've never talked to. You've seen them, but you've never made that effort, not even to say hello, which I even thought was, <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know. There's there's that thing of like you don't want to like encroach on someone else's private space or like, you know, sort of like step on the social contract that we all sort of like tacitly agree to with strangers. So I, I think there's, you know, the idea that you can't just walk up to that person and say hi to him, but you can like create a fake profile on an app and try to talk to him, which on one level is like actually a really inappropriate and kind of creepy, obsessive thing to do, but like comes from such a well-meaning place and I guess somehow feels more appropriate a way to try to reach out to somebody than like just having a direct confrontation with them, which, you know, I think societally we're all sort of told we're not supposed to do actually with strangers. Well, so. you, you... You had the couple do something that I think every single one of us are guilty of. We've Googled <laughs> our next door neighbor. Yeah. We may not know their name, but we know the address. And we will sit there for an hour or two searching to find out what their name is. And then what do we do? It, once you Google and you may find the name, then what's the next step? Instagram, Facebook, mm -hmm. the list goes on. And then you're... You're actually building and assuming your own personal character yeah. development on someone you don't even know. And we're all guilty. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you, I act, you so. actually show us that we're guilty. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> so I, I love that. But, you know, the humor of this film actually, for me, came into view in the latter part of the film. I mean, the ending brought a smile to my face. It was... It was the perfect ending. I mean, how long did it take you to figure out how to end the film? And did you have alternate ideas? No, that, I mean, that was sort of the idea all along. Like we, we sat down, we were all um, in Australia for work for a month and a half. And we sat down one afternoon, like on a beach, and we, we sort of came up with the entire movie straight through. And we knew it was going to end there. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think we always had that end point in mind. Like, we're... We're, we're teasing out like what a feature version of it would look like. And that ends in a very different way. Um, of course, and that, that moment sort of comes at the end of the first act and it has an entirely different um, sort of button on it to create, you know, sort of like another hour of story. But for the short version, I think that was always sort of where we felt like we were headed. Well, are you letting the cat out of the bag? Is there a possible full feature on this? We're, that's what we're working on right now. So, I, you know, who knows if we'll be able to get it made. But that's, uh, I think forever we thought there wasn't a story past this. We sort of always thought it was just going to be this, you know, sort of little 16-minute confection. But then I think over the summer we actually started to realize there was an opportunity to tell a story about a couple um, that not only goes further sort of in their obsession with this guy, but also their transformation as a result of what he wakes up can go much further. And so it's about um, 
the degree to which they really sort of shift and change themselves and in their relationship and how much they create space for that with one another and how they completely blow up their lives uh, as a result of this in, in you know, search of something that feels more spontaneous and alive and exciting to them. I think it would be great to see it possibly come become like a, a Netflix series because <laughs> because because what I love see one of my favorite things and 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 this is outside of full uh, feature films but when there's streaming series or if it's on network television or whatever character development mm-hmm. is one of the things that I love to watch I mean it's like people say oh I saw the first episode I didn't like it I'm not going to watch the rest of it. And I go, no, 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 you can't do that. The first episode is laying down the foundation of the right. characters. Then you can start seeing the story come to life as each episode comes into being. And with Troy, I could see it work. I think you'd probably have some really strong PR on this deal because everybody would be talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, like you say, like, I, I think I similarly am drawn to stories that are um, character driven. And I think hopefully with this, but I think so much of the work that like Jen and I have done in the theater and that we're looking to do in film are these stories where the characters are really accessible and the performances are emotionally grounded, but that assuming there can be that invitation for the audience to join in and get in on that ride with them, then the fun is in seeing how far you can continue to push the escalations and how far into absurdity and outrageousness you can sort of spin them while keeping them really believable and grounded and accessible. Like, um, I think about like, you know, sort of like some of Ostlin's films, or I even think about a TV show like Search Party, which was a big source of inspiration for us on this. You know, those, those stories go to such wildly unexpected places, but they're really at their heart journeys of character and about watching people change and develop yeah you know can you tell us a bit about the casting process because as it as i was watching i was like wow this is an all-star cast i mean i'm sitting there going wait a minute i know that guy and so you have adina verson you have Mm -hmm. dylan baker he was he was the one i actually i mean not thea i actually noticed dylan baker first i was like Wait a minute. I know that guy. And then you had <laughs> Dana Delaney in this film. How did the casting right. <laughs> come come to pass on this film? We I, we got super lucky. I mean, I think directing is 90% casting. <laughs> um, but we wrote it for friends of ours in the theater. Like Jen and I did a play in New York in 2018 called Collective Rage. And Dana Delaney and Adina were both in that. Um, Dana and Jen and Dane and I are all working on a show right now that's going to go up uh, first at the Goodman Theater in Chicago this winter, actually. Uh, That's a story of Dana's that uh, is about, you know, a a kind of unexpected intimacy between her and a young fan. And it all takes place over Twitter DMs and emails. But, uh, you know, Dana's like a collaborator of ours. And Dylan... Uh, Dylan was one of the first directors I ever got to assist when I got out of grad school. Um, and I was so lucky to meet him then. And he's been so supportive of me since then. Uh, you know, he is like one of the most incredible actors I think working today and an astonishing character actor and like a secret weapon in every movie and TV show, show that uses him. So I I feel like we did get really lucky that he agreed to. Yeah. He, he never plays the same character twice. And when I saw that, But but I, what I loved about the surprise was the fact that Dylan plays a customer. <laughs> Complete opposite what I would have ever envisioned as being him being the type of the type of character or the guy right. to go to Troy's apartment. I was like, wow, I didn't see that one coming. I mean, Good. that 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 was a surprise that was really cool. Oh, great. It's good. Yeah, that uh, that's the idea with getting Dylan to come do that scene. Well, uh, I love it, the fact that Dana Delaney, when she picks up the uh, the glass, I mean, right. she's like, she plays the part of people who are like, oh, it's kind of like, I want to hear the good stuff because they don't <laughs> live there. <laughs> And when she did that, I was I was sitting there just I was laughing because I was like, oh my gosh, we've all done that. 
I mean, I've done it. I mean, back in the day when you have an apartment and, and you hear the noise and uh, you, you grab a glass, you put it up to the yeah. wall and you're listening to try to get a better sound. I just literally thought that scene alone was so perfectly done. But for you, Mike, what has the audience's reaction been to your film? It's, I mean, it's been incredible. Um, I, I feel so lucky and it's, you know, it's so exceeded my wildest expectations for this. Like, I've been a theater director for the last decade and part of making this was me wanting to try to do something else and me and Jen wanting to see what it meant to develop something for film instead of for theater and seeing if we actually enjoyed doing that together. So this was such an experiment for me um, that I fell in love with. But, you know, the first time I ever got to see it screen with an audience, I missed our Tribeca premiere because I was doing a show in L.A. at the time. So the first time I ever saw it, we were screening with Outfest and we were part of an evening they had programmed at the Ford and Margaret Cho and their like queer stand-up comedy group were opening the show for us that evening. And because Margaret Cho was headlining, um, A, the audience was super warmed up before we ever screened, but it also meant that we had a sold out house. So we had 1200 people at the Ford that night. It was like, like totally sold out house at the Ford. And so the first time I ever got to watch this was with 1200 people um, at the same time. And it's, uh, it's incredible. I feel so um, grateful for how people have responded to it. You know, I, I've talked to so many film directors and when, the, when their film is screened for the first time, the reactions are all different. Some of them, they look around and they watch the audience's reaction and others, they just stare at the floor or they stand at the back because <laughs> they're so nervous. What did you do? <laughs> Uh, I was in the back of the Ford. I had like a group of friends around me, but I, I mostly watched the audience. Like in theater, you know, we'll spend five weeks sometimes in previews and I'll sit in the back of the house and I'll watch the audience watch the play. And you're feeling the energy of the house and you're feeling how people are listening to the play and how things are landing. And then you go in the next day and you get to tweak things based on how it landed with the audience. So that part of getting to experience how the ex the audience is experiencing it is is something that I really love. It's uh, it's really hard to do that knowing that you can't go in the next day and change things and tweak things like you can in the theater. Uh, but it, I do think it's fascinating to like sit in an audience and try to feel how they're listening to it and how it's landing for them. Well, what's the difference in energy between a theater audience and then an audience that's viewing a film? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I think you can feel when people are engaged and when they're tuned in or when they're a little disengaged, either because they're bored or it's not being received because they're not understanding it because you haven't done your job to make it clear for them who this person is or what the moment is or what the storytelling point is. And so I think in a, in a way, it sort of feels the same watching both a movie and watching theater. Like you can, you can feel people's attention spans and interest levels and you can hear it when they're audibly engaging with a thing. Um, you know, like you can hear rustles of programs or people moving in their self for their cell phone in their pockets. And that I think is sort of true across the board. You know, that's kind of funny because, you know, when I've heard this with theater, there's an energy. It's almost mm -hmm. like when a recording artist is on stage and, and giving a concert, they feed off the crowd's energy. Yeah. But with a film, the only it's way locked. you can even change it is if you have a test audience mm -hmm. beforehand. But, you know, with short films, there's not well, really a test audience. That. Yeah. Our test audience was after we froze, after we picture locked with 1,200 people. Um, but yeah, I mean, you do in a play, like, when, especially when you're doing a comedy, as you get response from the audience, the actors feed off of that. And, you talk about riding the laugh wave. So you let the, the laughter of the audience just crest and you come in just after it. So you're not letting it die and kill the energy in the room, but you're not coming in so soon that you're interrupting it and teaching the audience that they have to stop laughing and be quiet or they're going to miss hearing the next thing. And you can't do any of that in film. So there, there is that kind of like symbiotic relationship that you're robbed of, but I don't know, at least screening in a film festival, there's already an energy and a charge with the audience that maybe is a little different from just going to like the IFC or the AMC and watching a movie that's been out for weeks already. But um, yeah, it's still, I don't know, you can still feel when people are like with you or when you've lost them. You know, you bring up a really good point that I don't think a lot of people actually notice. And it's, and this is not with theater, because like you said, you can tweak 
you can tweak a theater performance on timing. But mm-hmm. with a film, how many of us have seen a film, and let's say a comedy, and we are literally just laughing so hard that when that scene changes and we're still laughing, we miss the beginning of the next scene or dialogue that was said. Because in a theater, you can't go, hey, could you rewind that, please? But if you're at home binging, you can. But, you know, that, that brings up a vital point for film directors on timing. Because if the audience is laughing their head off, and then there's, let's say, an important an important moment or a piece of dialogue comes up, and then everybody misses it. Yeah. And it's tough because it's like, you know, Cocaine Bear, which came out earlier this year, which I loved. And I went to like a midnight screening of the night it came out and that audience was packed and it was like the audience that movie was made for and it was raucous and riotous. The rhythm of how the audience responds because of how many people there are and how loud they are and how that encourages and people feed off of it. That's totally different than like if you're watching that movie on a plane with headphones and maybe you're not even laughing out loud, even though you're actually enjoying it and finding it funny. So it's it's tricky because the rhythm of a comedy also shifts wildly, not just like based on it being a film instead of a piece of theater, but like based on whether you're in a theater with a packed house or a Tuesday afternoon matinee with like three other people or, you know, it's it's tough. I don't I guess I don't know how you do that. You just sort of have to like. I, I guess you have to trust your instincts and try to feel it as best you can with your editor. You know, this is why film is not a science. Film is an art. And mm-hmm. there's so much to learn, but timing, wow, you know, that that's a whole that's a whole nother discussion right there. But for you, uh, what does it mean uh to be considered for an Oscar? You're Oscar qualified. Gosh, yeah, we are. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's it's incredibly humbling. I, I'm I'm hopeful because it it is at its heart, it is such a queer story, and I think it would mean so much to so many of us who are queer who worked on it to have the platform. Um, you know, like when your short gets shortlisted, or like if you get a, a nomination, even like the number of people across the country who watch your work, it's, it's incredible what kind of platform that is actually. So for that alone, it would, it would be, you know, incredible, but, um, I'm, I'm so fell in love with making movies. Like, you know, we spent four days filming this, but getting to work with these actors that I love for four days on set and then the process of getting to edit it. Like I, I love it so much. And, um, Jen and I are working on the feature version of this and we have another feature that we started working on. Uh, a year ago, um, like I'm, I'm hoping that this maybe helps us to get those made because it's such an incredible medium. You know, it's when I've talked to other directors who have been, uh, well, not just Oscar qualified, but they've been nominated. Some have right. won an Oscar, and yeah, it it elevates your exposure to a whole new level. And it's really funny to be uh, talking with so many where your film becomes Oscar qualified, like, wow. But the nervousness doesn't really hit until you got shortlisted because then you know... That it's real, right? (laughs) It could actually happen. Well, not just real. You know what the next step's going to be because it goes down from 15 to 5. And, you know, and then I've talked to the ones that were nominated for this year and it's, I mean, some of it's, it, that's when you start noticing the, um, oh, what's the word here? Um, they, they, they don't want to, uh, they don't want to jinx it. So they're sure. like, you know, like if, if I kindly said, you know, what would it mean to win? And they're like, no, 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 no. I mean, they're like, no, 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 no. We're not, we're, we're not going to go there. I, I don't want to jinx it. And I'm, and I'm like, Hey, it's okay to dream. You know, dream is 50-50. So it's not going to hurt anything. It's not going to jinx anything because this doesn't come around all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I I have zero expectations. Like, I I never dreamed that we were going to get into Sundance. Uh, I, like, never imagined that we would, you know, win any of these awards, like the Outfest Audience Award let alone that we'd be qualified. So I like any next step does feel genuinely really surprising. And it is, you know, it is a comedy and it's a small, weird little film. 
Um, but I am trying to enjoy it. Like the first, the first time I um, had a premiere off Broadway in New York, which you know, like as a young theater director, was a huge deal and an incredible opportunity. The artistic director of that theater, who was a wonderful mentor, um, said to me the night that we were getting ready to have our first audience, he was like, "Just enjoy this ride because this will never happen to you again." Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to be. Uh, grateful and like enjoy like each next thing that comes and have no expectations because uh, you know who knows and, well all uh, I can know, say is you've done a stellar job with Troy and uh, I would not be surprised if uh, you end up with Oscar qualifications again and who knows how far this will go to the to the golden trophy but where can the general public see Troy uh, can they see it anywhere at the moment yeah, so we are actually hosted on the New Yorker's screening room now. We're a part of the New Yorker short film family. So if you uh, Google Troy and the New Yorker, you'll find us on their website. We're also on their YouTube page. We're on their Vimeo page. We were also a short of the week, so we're on short of the week's uh, platform as well. Uh, and then we have a couple more festivals coming up. So if you're in Lisbon or Indianapolis or Key West in the next couple of weeks, you can check us out in person uh, in those cities too. Man, Mike, I want to thank you so much for coming on, uh, sharing your short film, Troy, with us. And ladies and gentlemen, it's Oscar qualified. And me being a huge lover of short films, I would rather watch short films all day than feature films because there is an art, there's a magic to creating short films because it's amazing that when you see a short film, how much waste there is in a feature film because I'm like, get to the point and they get to the point, but you remember it. And, and you know, Mike, Troy is the type of film that when you watch it, uh, you think about it, you know, you, you know, you kind of, you leave with a smile on your face and that's, that's the best thing, even if it's a dark comedy and, uh, but man, you're brilliant. It's a stellar job. Great team around you. And, uh, I'm looking for great things from you in the future. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Well, you're welcome, Mike. And ladies and gentlemen, again, check, go to the New Yorker. I think it's just newyorker.com. You can go in their search box, look up Troy. So ladies and gentlemen, go to Bond on Cinema Online. Watch the replay of our interview on YouTube. We are also on multiple audio digital platforms. We have numerous interviews with top film directors just like Mike Donahue. Also top producers and screenwriters, actors and more. And many of them, well, they are top award winners. So we only bring you the best. So again, thank you for watching, ladies and gentlemen, and listening. And I'll see you next time.